This is Bloomberg Law with June Grosso from Bloomberg Radio. A game-changing appellate court win for the crypto industry and a stinging defeat for the SEC. The D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals overturned the SEC's decision to block Grayscale Investments' proposed spot Bitcoin exchange-traded fund. Grayscale's CEO Michael Sonnenschein called it a huge victory for the crypto industry. A panel of three judges unanimously voted and agreed with Grayscale, and that actually vacates the SEC denial order. Huge win for Grayscale, huge win for our investors, and really the crypto and investment community is as a whole. But the decision doesn't mean that Grayscale can launch its Bitcoin ETF. It's still a long road ahead. The SEC will likely appeal the decision, and it may even reject the ETF applications of Grayscale and other companies with a different justification. My guest is Anthony Sabino, a professor of law at St. John's University's Tobin College of Business and a partner at Sabino & Sabino. Anthony, is this a landmark victory for the crypto industry? It is definitely a landmark in the sense that it now shows a clear path for future crypto products to be registered for trading on the exchange. But in a legal sense, it's really not all that earth-shattering, June, for the simple reason that the D.C. Circuit's opinion in terms of the legal basis was fairly narrow. The essence of it is that the D.C. Circuit stated that the SEC, in denying Grayscale Investments proposed ETP exchange traded product of Bitcoin, the SEC was arbitrary and capricious and abused its discretion. That's the legal standard for agency action. Agencies must make their decisions, uh, regulatory decisions, on a reasoned, rational, and well informed basis. And the D.C. Circuit basically said, no, you did not. And the reason why they found it arbitrary, capricious, abuse, discretion, again, those are the words for the last hundred years, was the fact that within the last year or so, the commission had approved similar products, and those being exchange-traded products, ETPs, for Bitcoin futures. And the D.C. Circuit, in a very thoughtful, very extensive opinion, laid out in great detail how there are extraordinary similarities between the markets for Bitcoin futures. And while distinct from Bitcoin per se on the spot market, there are many, many similarities. So bottom line is this, says the D.C. Circuit, SEC, you approve two of the Bitcoin futures products to be traded on various exchanges. But you said no to Grayscale's spot market Bitcoin product. And that's arbitrary, capricious abuse discretion. And that's how we got to this decision. Critics have said that SEC Chair Gary Gensler has overstepped in his attempt to clamp down on the crypto industry. Is the court saying that, too, in this decision? No, not really. And I'll I'll address in a moment the critics of Chairman Gensler. But in truth, it is a criticism that can't be denied. That's obvious. And they are faulting the commission for, in this instance, making a decision that was, again, arbitrary, capricious. In essence, you did not treat similar products. And again, June, those are the precise words of the opinion, which is a wonderful read, by the way, for this audience, because the D.C. Circuit Circuit Judge Naomi Rao took the time to really explain to both expert and neophyte alike what Bitcoin is all about, how it works, the difference between Bitcoin spot market, Bitcoin futures. But once again, the essence of the opinion was to say, look, Okay, you took the Bitcoin futures products from two other outfits. I think one is called Valkyrie and Ecom. I apologize for mispronouncing that. And you approve that. But the similarities are so much so, especially with respect to preventive measures to prevent against fraud and market manipulation, that basically it's, again, the circuit's words were similar products. So if you approved two products that were similar, then you have to approve the third one, which is the Grayscale product. With respect to criticism of Mr. Gensler, look, that's been going on, and it, it has to go on. It should go on for the simple reason that he is an appointee of the administration. He must be accountable to the American people. He's an unelected person, and again, a person of great credentials, great reputation, etc. The bottom line, the market has a right to criticize, but the court here, I do not view it in any way as criticizing Chairman Gensler's particular tactics or policies in this regard, so he'll keep going on doing what he's doing. But once again, to sort of fairly exposit with both sides, the crypto market is, of course, going to be critical because they're like, look, it's crypto. We know what we're doing. Leave us alone. That's fine to an extent. But again, some people used to say that in 1927, 1928, and that's how you had the unregulated market and the crash in 29. On the other hand, we do live in a free enterprise, uh, free market. 
And therefore, there has to be a point where the regulators have to sort of step back and say, all right, let the market function, let the market weed things out, and let's experiment. And I also think that's where we have to make the point that regulatory authority is strictly cabined by the statutory authority that Congress gives it. And in an indirect way, okay, and again, the D.C. Circuit really not criticizing, but by using the legal standard and also calling upon the statute, which regulates the SEC process, June, for how new products come to market and how they're approved by a rule change, etc. Basically, the D.C. Circuit is saying, look, there's rules, there are statutes, they were made by Congress, and now SEC, you have to follow them. Oh, and in this instance, you did not follow the rule, your actions were, here we go again, arbitrary, capricious, abuse of discretion, because essentially you didn't follow the statute, you were inconsistent in your results on these substantially similar products, so on and so forth. The SEC has 45 days to appeal the ruling. An agency spokesperson said it was reviewing the court's decision in order to determine next steps. Right. It could ask for an on-bank hearing before the full D.C. Circuit or petition the Supreme Court. Does the SEC almost have to appeal this? I would say yes. I would say yes for a number of reasons. Okay, and an appeal is a foregone conclusion. Although I would say, as you've articulated the steps so correctly, is that they'll do for an en banc. In other words, there is the entire D.C. Circuit to hear this of some 15 or so judges as opposed to these three. And by the way, this is kind of a powerhouse panel here because Judge Rao was very well known. One of the other judges there is Harry Edwards, a senior circuit judge from decades ago, and the chief judge of the D.C. Circuit, which is Judge Srinivasan, who you may remember only a few years ago was on the short list of Mr. Obama. Obama to be the next nominee to the U.S. Supreme Court. So that's kind of a, you know, a well-credentialed, a supercharged panel. But that's only the three. So they're going to ask for an on-bank hearing, and then whoever wins or loses in that is probably going to appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. One of the reasons why I'm so convinced that there will be an appeal is, number one, it's the government. And as we well, and as your audience knows well, the government appeals every adverse decision because, heck, they're funded by our taxpayer dollars, all right? <laughs> and secondly, the government hates to lose, all right? And the SEC has had a few setbacks in recent years. Right now, there's the Jarkazi case pending with respect to the power of removal of SEC administrative law judges. Five years ago, they lost the Lucia case that SEC admin law judges have to be appointed by the president and so forth. So the SEC, you know, they've had a few wins, but they've had a few losses here as well. So darn right, they're not going to take this sitting down. And also, in essence, right now, June, they've taken a black eye because it's not fun for them to have the D.C. Circuit, which hears many, many of these cases, when it comes to federal regulations and challenges there, too. They're really the locus of all this litigation. So when the D.C. Circuit says, hey, SEC, you were arbitrary, you were capricious, you abused your discretion, they don't like that, so they want to get that flipped around. I will say this, though. While I am convinced an appeal shall be had by whatever means, the bottom line is, what are the chances of prevailing? That's a pretty good question, too. And if you don't mind, I'll answer it by <laughs> saying that's, good. that's going to be tough. Because basically, when you have a decision that says the agency acted in an arbitrary, capricious manner, that's very fact-intensive. And as we all well know, the Supreme Court does not engage in fact-finding. They take the record as is. And the D.C. Circuit, and again, kudos to Circuit Judge Rao, there's a very extensive factual record here built upon the commission's own record. But there is extensive fact-finding here where the D.C. Circuit in the Grayscale decision explains point for point why the commission's decision was arbitrary and capricious. What kind of guideposts did this decision leave that might be helpful to other crypto firms? And again, that's the interesting point. The circuit court, the D.C. Circuit, says, okay, the SEC was arbitrary and capricious, did not provide a rational basis for its decision. We're not going to make the same mistake. We're going to explain to you point by point in detail why we found their actions to be without a proper factual basis. And having put that forth, okay, they'll appeal to the Supreme Court eventually, the SEC, but the court may very well not decide this case because, once again, we come back to the fact, June, that it was decided on a very narrow legal ground. There's no new legal ground to be broken here Although, as you said at the outset, and I agree completely, this is a very game-changing decision for the crypto industry as a whole, because in many respects, it provides a roadmap for other funds and a path for various firms to create investment vehicles in crypto, because all they really have to do is read the D.C. Circuit's opinion and say, oh, okay, this is how Grayscale did it. So guess what? An invitation is the sincerest form of flattery. So they got it right before the D.C. Circuit. Whatever they did, will do. And especially, I think, what's important is the D.C. Circuit made much of the fact 
that one of the reasons why the SEC's decision was arbitrary was they basically poo-pooed the fact, they overlooked the fact, that there was more than adequate surveillance to protect market integrity. So, again, I'm not giving any advice to crypto fund managers, but read that opinion for yourself, and you'll see how important it is to demonstrate that whatever your proposed product is going to be, you have to show that there are safeguards, uh, guardrails, and so forth to prevent fraud and manipulation, and that your product is tied to market surveillance such as that conducted by the CME, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. That way, in the event of manipulation or fraud, it can be detected and rooted out. That was a very important guidepost, if you will, that the D.C. Circuit set out in his opinion and words that the crypto industry must take very, very seriously and follow to the letter. Anthony, this doesn't mean that the Grayscale ETF is automatically approved, does it? No, not at all. Okay, what it means is the commission's decision is overturned as arbitrary and capricious, but Grayscale has to go back. And again, as I understand the process, essentially they have to, you know, come back and again reapply something along those lines. So in essence, the D.C. Circuit says the commission was wrong to say no to you, but now basically I would think the process would start afresh or close to a fresh start, and then it has to get approved. So they still have to get approval. So it's not a done deal, and thank you, that's an excellent point, and I concur completely, is that it's not over by any means, and the SEC may find other grounds to object. I may say, okay, we were called arbitrary capricious this time, but now let's really dig in and tell a future court of review, which would probably be the D.C. Circuit again, this is why we said no, if indeed they say no. But, you know, Grayscale's got plenty of work to do, so they're not there yet, but they're, they're a big step closer to getting that ETP out there. ETF, right? Well, you know, that's interesting because we call them ETFs, and that's correct. But the court, by the way, calls them ETPs, exchange traded product. And you know what? You say potato, I say potato. I, I think it's really the same thing. But you know what? When the D.C. Circuit speaks, I clam up and <laughs> right. follow what they say. The SEC is already fighting a lower court ruling over sales of Ripple's right. XRP token, but mm-hmm. it's still moving ahead with a series of high-profile enforcement actions, including against Coinbase, Global, and Binance Holdings. Do you think the SEC should take a pause, maybe? Well, you know what? In all honesty, no, okay, because that's their job. That's their portfolio. They've been charged with enforcing the securities law, protecting investors, and maintaining market integrity. So I think they should go forward. The the Ripple case, certainly, again, we have uh, that decision from the Southern District of New York. I think that was Judge Annalise Torres. Mm -hmm. And again, she decided that. And we have to remember, and I haven't digested completely, it's it's a big decision. Uh, But as we know, in essence, the court said, look, some aspects of Bitcoin are commodities, and the SEC has no jurisdiction to kick it over the CFTC, but other things do qualify as securities, and therefore the SEC can regulate them, etc. But of course, Ripple is going to be appealed, and that probably will get all the way up to the Supreme Court, I would think, because it's such an important issue, not just in terms of the law, but in terms of the future of the American financial markets. So that's, let's call it unsettled at this time. With the other actions, again, they're very different. Finance, as I remember, we talked about this quite a while ago, and there's a host of charges there. That's the one, if I recall, is where they've been charged with not registering as a fund. That's really, really serious. So this is important work that the commission has to do. So I don't think they should pause, but they should take the weekend, if you will, to sit back, reflect, and say, okay, what's the strategy here? Because you've got a lot of different pieces. They're fighting a lot of different battles on different fronts, and I think... There is, to an extent, an overall strategy, but I think Chairman Gensler owes it to himself and, more importantly, to the American people and to the financial markets to say, let's have a comprehensive strategy here. To whatever extent the Ripple decision was adverse to the commission, the SEC has to learn from that and say, okay, we've lost this. And again, they're going to appeal it. But as things stand today, June, I would say they need to reflect upon that and take a step back and say, okay, how do we modify our strategy from here? And once again, There is still at the very heart of this, okay, that the eye of the storm is that fundamental issue. When it comes to investing in Bitcoin, are you buying a commodity, which kicks it over to the CFTC and the commodities laws, or are you buying a security, which is purely the SEC's bailiwick and under the federal securities laws? And that's the key distinction. And because of the newness of crypto, because of its its flexible nature, we're really not sure about all that. And I certainly don't want the SEC to back off. But at the same time, the Bitcoin industry, the crypto industry, has every right to continue to innovate, to make progress, and move forward what they're doing. But again, within this, the regulatory framework that's there. So again, many, many unresolved issues. But I really think it depends upon the industry itself. 
It can and it should and it must innovate. And then as it innovates, we see, okay, are you selling a commodity? Are you selling a security? And if so, have you complied with regulatory framework pertinent to each? And also, Judge Rakoff came down with a different take on it than Judge Torres. Right, right. And, you know, that's, again, one of the interesting facets, as your learned audience, I'm sure, knows, is that here you have two very prominent judges in the Southern District of New York, which really is, you know, with two subway stops from Wall Street and also is the primary court for Wall Street-type disputes to go to in the first instance. And, of course, Jed Rakoff is absolutely a living legend when it comes to federal securities law. But what it demonstrates is that you can have two judges of equal rank in the same district and disagree, and they're allowed to do that. And there's about another 25 judges in Southern District, and they could also all disagree. That's why the real key is going to be, let's see what happens when Ripple and the Rakoff decision, I don't recall which case it was, goes up to the Second Circuit, because they're there to conciliate these and to reconcile one decision to the other. And then they get the next-to-last word, and why I say next-to-last word is because they could still go to the U.S. Supreme Court. But let's also keep in mind, as the Supreme Court itself said decades ago, they regard the Second Circuit as the, quote, mother court, close quote, of the federal securities laws. They are very deferential to what the Second Circuit says. So the battle or the controversy is far from over June. This is just one of many battles, and we have to see what the Second Circuit says about Ripple and these related cases in the years to come. And also, as we have new permutations and innovations by the industry, once again, okay, where do they fall in the market? Which regulatory framework would they fall within, et cetera, et cetera? So I think really bottom line is that everybody's going to go great guns. Crypto is on a roll. It's not going to stop. Okay, Gary Gensler wants to make sure his agency is regulating this, and that's consistent with his personal behavior because he regulated it as the head of the CFTC not too long ago. And the CFTC says, wait a minute, okay, Bitcoin, that's a commodity. It's like, you know, any other kind of future. It's like oil and gas and pork bellies and what have you. So guess what? We want to regulate it too. So a lot of action, a lot of controversy in the years to come. This is just one stop. Okay, my advice is everybody have a good Labor Day weekend because the battle's going to start as soon as we get back. Okay, thanks so much. That's Professor Anthony Sabino of St. John's University's Tobin College of Business. And that's it for this edition of the Bloomberg Law Show. Remember, you can always get the latest legal news on our Bloomberg Law podcast. You can find them on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and at www.bloomberg.com slash podcast slash law. And remember to tune into the Bloomberg Law Show every weeknight at 10 p.m. Wall Street time. I'm June Grosso, and you're listening to Bloomberg.